WIS Columbia, the station you count on for local news. This is WIS News 10's News Watch. Good morning and welcome to the special edition of News Watch. I'm Ben Hoover. The South Carolina primaries are a little more than one month away at this point, and today we have gathered the Republican candidates for South Carolina Attorney General for debate on the issues. And joining us this morning are Columbia Attorney and former federal and state prosecutor Robert Bolchus. Columbia Attorney and former Senate Subcommittee Counselor Leighton Lord, and former Assistant Lexington County Solicitor and former Assistant Attorney General Alan Wilson. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. We, we appreciate it. So basically, this is how it'll go this morning. First, I will ask you some questions. Then in the next segment, you'll be responding to some questions that we got from our viewers on our website, WISTV.com. And in the last segment, you'll get to ask questions of each other. And that is the segment I'm most looking forward to this morning. So each candidate will get a minute to respond to questions and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if we need that. We are going to start this morning in alphabetical order, and that means, Mr. Bolchus, you'll be going first. So the first question this morning, you recently told a crowd that South Carolina has not opened a prison since 1994, and the entire state population has grown by one million people since then. You said that maybe we need to drop the 800 people out of the Department of Education who are not teaching kids and put that money into public safety and the prisons. Is that a realistic goal? I think it is. I think we've we've really, in my view, we've really gotten off track with our priorities in terms of funding the number one priority of government, which is public safety. I mean, when we have a circumstance where there are that many people that aren't teaching school, or we haven't opened a prison in 15 years, and we're actually considering letting people out of prison for the purpose of, of overcoming that, uh, that crowd, I think we're really off track in terms of our priorities as a government. And in those statements, you said that, um, you know, we should not be letting people out of prison, that that is not the answer. Can you, can you take 30 seconds? I mean, how many prisons are you talking about that we need to build? And how would we pay for that? You know, well, the first, we would pay for it by setting our priorities right as a government, as a legislature, and, and, and funding what we need, which is public safety. But the fact of the matter is this. The theory that we have a lot of people in prison that don't belong there that should be released into the, into the public is, is hogwash. I mean, we, you practically have to break into prison in this state. And I can tell you that after 10 years working as a prosecutor, we don't have a lot of people locked up who, are, are not, uh, who do not deserve to be locked up. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lord, you played a significant role in bringing Boeing here to South Carolina. Some observers, including the South Carolina Policy Council, have been extremely critical of that deal in particular. What limits and scrutiny, if any, should be placed on the kind of deal cutting that led to Boeing's decision? Well, the most important thing to remember about Boeing is we were trying to bring thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to the state. Our tax system is broken. We have a 10.5% manufacturing property tax, highest in the nation. Washington State has a 4%. Boeing would not move here unless we could adjust the property taxes. It's wrong that we had to adjust the property taxes. It's wrong that we had to give them a special property tax deal. But it wasn't wrong that we cut the deal. It was wrong that our tax system's broken. Does that set a precedent, though? I mean, how far will we take these 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 deals like this with Boeing? Will we we offer other companies trying to come to the state the same deal? Well, most all manufacturing companies that come to South Carolina get a special property tax deal. I don't know of any that have ever come to South Carolina and taken on the ten and a half percent property tax. There may be one or two out there, but I don't know of any. BMW didn't. Michelin didn't. And what we have to do is fix our tax system so we don't have to cut deals with companies. But we need first-class manufacturing in this state. I'm very proud of the fact that the whole world is going to buy a product manufactured in South Carolina. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson, next question is for you. Raising money from donors, of course, uh, is very important to winning political office. I know you know that. Uh, the latest list of campaign contributions show that shows you in the lead with nearly $460,000. I think we have um, a graphic to show you with this. Uh, but if you take away a $250,000 loan your campaign took out from a bank, that puts you in third place. Should voters be concerned with your ability to gain money and support? Oh, absolutely not. First off, we're a very competitive campaign. We've been tracking this election from the very beginning. Uh, we've got poll numbers that indicate that I'm very strong in certain areas of the state. And so the purpose of raising money is to get your name out and your message out. 
uh, our, our, what we're hearing is that we're, we're resonating with the voters. Not only are we resonating with the voters, but our name ID is out there. So, you know, it's not all about money. It's about a strong, effective grassroots uh, organization, which I have. I have a lot of visit, um, a lot of volunteers, very few paid staffers on my campaign. So the majority of my campaign are run by concerned citizens who are working on a volunteer basis. So money should not be the determination of who wins or loses this race. I uh, had a little follow-up here. Some of the blogs have criticized that, that loan in particular, that $250,000 loan, because your boss at your law firm right now sits on the board of that bank. Is that true? And should voters be concerned with the conflict of interest right there? Well, first off, um, I already have an account at that bank. I've had an account at that bank since last year. Um, I went through all the, the papers, the, signing all the papers that anybody would have to sign in order to get a loan from any bank. So there was no special preferential treatment. Okay, let's move on to um, th this next question here. Uh, of course, we've been following the developments in the state of Arizona. Uh, recently, that state passed a new law that makes it a state crime to be in the U.S. illegally. That is a move, of course, to crack down on illegal immigrants. Now, South Carolina passed and Governor Sanford signed into law back in 2008 what was supposed to be at that time one of the toughest anti-illegal immigration bills in the nation at that point. Does South Carolina already have a solid law in place or does more need to be done like they're doing in Ona? Let's let Mr. Lord take that question first. First, immigration should and is a federal responsibility. What, what you're seeing in Arizona is a reaction to the federal government failing to adequately address the issue. The federal government's not enforcing the immigration laws internally, and they're not protecting the border. Uh, there are ways that this can be dealt with better. One of those is a program called 287G, which I helped work on when I worked for the Senate. This allows the feds to deputize local law enforcement to have immigration functions. What I'd like to do as Attorney General is deal with foreign-born criminal aliens, deal with those who come here illegally and commit crimes. That will be my priority as Attorney General. Mr. Wilson? Well, first off, in uh, 2008, Governor Sanford signed into law the South Carolina Illegal Immigration Reform Act. First thing I'd like to do is I'd like to go back and see if that act is actually being enforced. Um, you know, there's provisions. It's a very tough illegal immigration act. You know, you can have the toughest laws in the books, but if they're not being funded properly or enforced, at least enforced, then they're no good. Secondly, and I, I do agree that we have a 280C. 287G program that deputizes local law enforcement, but we also have another resource that we could possibly tap into, and that's the South Carolina National Guard. We have an, we have an intelligence community with the National Guard that we could operate under Title 32 as opposed to Title 10, which is a federal federalization of the National Guard, and we can actually uh, support local law enforcement through some of our military assets. As Attorney General, and as the only candidate up here who actually serves in the National Guard, I'm a major and I'm an Iraqi war veteran, so I have actually worked with the intelligence community within the military, so I know its capability in supporting local law enforcement. As Attorney General, I would spearhead that initiative. Okay, Mr. Bolches? You know, number one, I think we can agree that the federal government has not done the job and, and is not likely to do the job in the in the near future regarding immigration. They, they've failed miserably and I, I think both of my opponents would uh, vouch for the fact that I have been proposing for five months a very similar uh, law here in South Carolina. Uh, the bottom line is the states are going to have to look out for themselves and that's what that's what Arizona's done and they, they actually have a proposal in that bill in that law which will, in addition to allowing the police to to police the problem, they actually have a provision that will allow the police to round up uh, the folks who are in violation of that law and deliver them into the custody of the federal government, which is exactly what I've been proposing for five months, and I think that is that is likely where we're headed. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a, a, a commercial break right here, and when we come back, our candidates answer questions that you, our viewers, have submitted on WISTV.com. We'll be right back.